Okay, welcome to another Orbiter 2010 video. And this video is going to be another installment in my Absolute Beginner Guide, the video series that I'm putting together that has a special focus on people who are brand new to Orbiter. Now, typically I would recommend that you watch all these videos in order. So if you happen to be finding my channel for the first time here in this video, it's probably a good idea to stop the video, go back to number one and work your way forward from there. At the very least, uh, you should have some familiarity with, you know, taking off, getting into orbit. And I'm here in this video in the XR2 Ravenstar, so I'm also assuming that you already have that installed. In the uh, last video, I actually covered how to download and install the XR2 Ravenstar. So at the very least, make sure that you've gone over that video. So as we become better Orbinauts, we're you know, we get to the point where, you know, the standard Delta Glider probably uh, isn't sufficient anymore. At least it's not as fun to fly, in my opinion, at least. So I thought we'd take a look, just uh, just take a brief look at the XR2 Ravenstar, how to fly it, what's different about it, and just kind of how to get around with it. Now, once again, your uh, 2D panel may look different than mine. And again, the reason for that is screen resolution. I covered all that in the last video, so I'm not going to go into it again. But if yours doesn't look exactly like this, then just know that your screen resolution is probably different than mine. Now, getting the XR2 up off the ground and into the air is no different than the uh, standard Delta Glider. You know, there isn't any additional uh, checklists or anything that we need to cover that we wouldn't cover with the standard Delta Glider, just the basics, you know, make sure that the nose cone's closed, make sure that the retro doors are closed. And in the XR2, we have, uh, we have hover doors. And if for any reason those were open, you would want to make sure that those were closed. And you'd want to make sure the air brake is closed. Um, I guess that's also new. Um, actually, no, the, the standard Delta Glider has air brakes as well. So just make sure that everything's closed up and ready for flight. You know, if your nose cone's open, then obviously you're not ready for takeoff. This scenario comes with the XR2 installation. It's uh, number one. It's ready for takeoff to ISS. We're not actually going to fly to the ISS in this video, but that's uh, what this scenario is. And by default, it's all it's ready to fly, so you don't have to go through and close anything. So let's just get ready here. The one thing that we do have to do differently in the XR2 or even the XR5 or XR1 for that matter that's different than the standard Delta Glider is that we cannot turn on surface controls unless we have the APU running. Notice if I right click over here on surface controls, nothing happens. So one thing that we have to do differently is we have to uh, click here to turn on the APU and the APU basically provides uh, hydraulic fluid and functionality to the surface controls. So now we can right click over here to turn on. surface controls on. And if we look at the external view, uh, we now have yaw control. We have, you know, use of our ailerons slash elevator, and I can have pitch control as well. So let's go ahead and take off. Uh, you'll notice when we take off and head down the runway, you'll hear a call out at uh, V1 and uh, rotate. You don't get that with the standard Delta Glider. And this is uh, certain terminology that you may not be familiar with. You can do a Google search on what V1 means. Basically, it's a, it's a point where you get so far down the runway that you have to make a decision as to whether or not you're going to lift off or abort. Uh, once you get past V1, uh, you need to abort, in other words, kill the throttle and apply the brakes, or you need to commit to the takeoff. Uh, typically in orbiter, that type of thing, you know, it's just, um, it's just there for, uh, for aesthetics or for atmosphere. You know, the, the, the XR2 isn't going to fail or anything like that. There aren't any built-in failures that I'm aware of. So let's go full throttle. And as we get rolling down the runway here, you'll notice Got our 100 knot call out. And sometimes we, there's the V1 call out. And now we got the rotate call out. You want to pitch up right away when you get the uh, rotate call out. 
And as soon as you get to about 10 meters, you want to you want to raise the landing gear immediately because you will actually you will actually destroy the landing gear if you are full throttle on the main engines and you don't raise the landing gear by the time you get up to a certain velocity you will actually uh, destroy the landing gear and cause a failure so let's just kind of fly around here at KSC so we're flying uh, runway 15 and if we kind of use our hat switch here we can tilt the view around to see where we're at and where we're going and the one thing that I find useful to do when you're trying out any new craft, uh, if you're wanting to learn how to you know, take off and land, is to kind of fly around the, the airport that you start out at, maybe do a couple of circles, just get a feel for what the controls feel like, how it's different from the Delta Glider. When you're flying at full throttle, the Delta Glider and the XR2 are kind of similar. There's not a huge difference between them, but once you once you're ready to land, there's a pretty good difference between the XR1, uh, XR2, and the standard Delta Glider. So it's not a bad idea to take off, uh, fly the runway heading kind of like we are now, get downrange by you know a ways, just fly for two three minutes whatever, and then turn around and fly back to the runway and try to land. That way you can get a feel for how. Uh, you know how the vessel is different from the standard Delta Glider. The XR2 has much more has a higher lift drag ratio, so it tends to float more so than the standard Delta than the standard Delta Glider, which can actually make it harder to land at first because you'll tend to overshoot the runway. But once you get familiar with the XR2, I actually find that the XR2 is much easier to land. So we've gone down range a bit. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do a complete loop. So I'm gonna pull back, careful not to pull back too much because you will overstress the uh, wings. So we're just gonna do a complete loop over the top. Now we're going back the other way. And once we get down to about 10 degrees or so, we'll uh, roll over and head back toward that runway. Okay, there we are, we're about 10 degrees. So now we'll roll over and we're gonna go back to the to the same runway we took off from, just in the other direction, and we're gonna land. So now we can actually cut the throttle. We've got all the velocity that we need to get over to the runway and land. And remember, wherever the velocity vector is pointed, that's where you are going. So right now the velocity vector is not pointed at the runway, so I'm just doing a bit of banking and rolling the vessel till I get that velocity vector back over toward the runway. And this just gives you a good feel again for you know how to land because one of the things that can be frustrating I have no idea what that sound is. One of the things that can be frustrating when you're trying to land if you go through the whole process of deorbit, re-entry, you arrive at the base you, and you're targeted and then you get to this point where I'm at now and then you flub the landing because you just don't have a good feel. 5, you don't have a good feel for what the vessel will respond, how it will respond when you are ready to land. So before you bother, you know, trying to take off oh, or rather before you bother trying to you know, to complete the whole process of deorbit and reentry, spend some time at the base, you know, whether you're going to be landing at KSC or, you know, Wide Awake or whatever, spend some time taking off from the runway, fly out 30 kilometers or so, and then turn back in toward the base and try to land on the runway. And just do that until you have a lot of uh, practice and you feel comfortable with everything. I can't really give you specific numbers to go by landing in my opinion is a well, lot of just it's a lot of feel I'm gonna throw out the air brakes i'm going a little fast here once we get down a little bit lower in velocity we'll throw out the landing gear 500. 
Okay, landing gear. You also don't want to put out the landing gear too soon when you're landing. Let me bring the air brake back in. Pitch up a little bit. And there we go, now we're landed. Let's uh, go full throttle and take off and we'll fly out again and we'll just turn back around and uh, do another landing. Actually, I'm going way too fast. Warning. Gear deployed. Gear I may actually destroy the gear if I'm not careful. I had to throttle Warning. way back. Gear deployed. Gear up and okay, there we go. Now we can go full throttle on the main. And we'll fly out away from the runway a bit, uh, turn, turn around and come back in. And if you do this uh, several times, you'll get a really good feel for how the vessel responds and when you need to begin your uh, your flare, how fast you need to be going when you're crossing over top, uh, when you're crossing the front of the runway. And it's, it's hard, in my opinion, to give you specific numbers to say, okay, well, when you're 10 kilometers out, you need to be going this fast or anything like that. I can't, I can't really get, I, I don't go by that when I'm flying myself. It's strictly just, I've done enough flights that I know what it should feel like. Uh, it's more of an altitude thing than it is velocity. I, I, because I do all my uh, landings with the you know standard Delta glider and all the XR vessels totally dead stick. So it's not a matter of throttling up, throttling back like you would if you're flying in a you know just a standard flight simulator. So let's go out here a little bit farther. We're we're 36 kilometers from the center of the base. That's not necessarily. I'm looking here. That's not necessarily how far we are from the runway, that's how far we are from the center of the base. So 40 kilometers, let's go ahead and circle around, you know, do a complete reverse uh, roll. I don't know what that thumping sound is, that's weird, I don't, I've never heard that before. Okay, now we're coming around. And we can actually kill the throttle at this point and do another dead stick landing on the runway. Subsonic. Uh, hopefully by at least observing what I'm doing, you can get some idea of what to do on your own. Um, again, at this point, it's always just a matter of putting the velocity vector on the runway. And of course, making sure that you're in line with the runway and that you're not arriving. You know, you don't want to be arriving at a harsh angle to the runway. I would say about the only thing I could tell you in terms of specific numbers is, you know, A, don't extend the landing gear until you're below 200 meters a second according to what you see here. If you put out your landing gear too soon, uh, you, will, you will destroy it, which will be a failure. And if you, like right now I'm at a, almost a 20 degree down pitch, so I know from experience that I'm not really going to slow down all that much. So here, when I get a little closer to the runway, I'm going to throw out the air brake just to bring my airspeed down a little bit. Because 259 meters a second, that's that's getting near Mach 1. That's a little too fast for landing. So somewhere around here, and this no reason, it just feels good to me. So I'm putting out the air brake. And you can see my uh, airspeed coming way down. I don't want to leave the air brake out the whole time, though, necessarily, because it will I will slow down too much and stall. You are cleared to Although I might be able to leave it out the whole time now, because I didn't extend it, uh, didn't extend it too early. So I'm going to go ahead and put the air brake back in, just so I don't reach a stall speed, and throw the gear down. And you really got to watch your vertical speed. You will, if you hit the ground too hard, you will uh, cause a failure. That's another big difference between the XR2 and the standard Delta Glider. If you touch down with a vertical speed of greater than, hang on one second, I'll tell you the exact number. It, it actually gives you all the information on the lower panel, but I can't bring it up just yet. Let me come to a complete stop. 100 knots. All right, we're basically stopped. 
So if I go down to the lower panel, I can actually see here landing your max touchdown rate under a full load, which would basically be, you know, with the full crew and all of your, you know, main fuel and everything filled up to the maximum, then you cannot touch down greater than 2.8 meters per second or you'll, uh, or the, you'll cause a failure with the landing gear. And then it says under a typical load, you can touch down with the, with up to 4.2 meters per second. And these numbers are surprisingly low uh, if you get in the bad habit of landing the Delta Glider and just slamming into the runway at 10, 15, 20 meters a second, which you can totally get away with in the standard Delta Glider. But if you get if you develop that habit, you'll find that landing the the, the XR2 is really hard because you're gonna be you're gonna be slamming the runway at five, six, seven meters a second at least, and you're always going to be causing gear failures. So you, you really got to get into the habit of arriving at the runway sufficiently slow enough so that when you start pitching up for your flare, you don't climb. Uh, you know, if you arrive at the runway and you, you're pitching up when you're still 250 meters a second, you won't flare. Rather, instead, you'll climb and you'll end up stalling and smashing into the ground. So that's a little bit about, you know, just getting familiar with the vessel. Take off, fly around the airport a few times. Uh, just spend an afternoon doing it, you know, a couple hours and some afternoon, and it's, and it's fun to do. Another thing I want to talk about in this particular video is the fact that the XR2, we have temperature concerns with, the, with all the XR vessels. I kind of always make the joke that the standard Delta Glider is made of unobtainium, which is a metal that uh, doesn't exist in real life. It's so durable that you could drop it into a volcano and it would be fine. The XR2, on the other hand, is, uh, you know, it's a fictional craft, but it's made of metals that, at least it's in simulation sense, it's made of metals that will actually overheat. So let's take off and let's kind of show what we, what, what we can experience. There's a V1, let's rotate. And we're going to go off the end of the runway, but that's okay. This is just a demonstration. Raise the landing gear, and let's go to let's go to a heading of 90 degrees. And one other thing I'll say, and I'm just this is just a personal opinion. I really think it's a good idea to fly with a joystick when you're in the atmosphere. If you try to fly with keyboard controls only, the problem with flying with keyboard controls only is that. All the, all the control surfaces are either on or off. So like when you press six and four to, to bank the bustle, it's, it's on or off. You know, whereas when you have a joystick, you can bank slightly to the left or slightly to the right. At any rate, what we want to watch as we take off and head up towards space is our temperature display down here. You'll note that with the XR2, and again this also applies to the XR5, we, it, it's easy to overheat the vessel and destroy it if you're used to flying. Let's uh, change our cockpit display color. If you get into the habit uh, of flying the XR, uh, flying the standard Delta Glider in, in, sort of a, in sort of an ascent profile that's not necessarily the best profile, you can, uh, if, you, if you then try to duplicate that with the XR2, you're going to find that it, you, you can't ever get to space because you're constantly overheating the vessel and destroying it. Uh, we won't cover scram ascent in this one, actually, perhaps we might have to. I was going to say we won't cover scram ascent, but I burned up so much fuel flying around the, uh, flying around KSC, we're going to have to use scram. With the uh, XR2, typically you need to get up to about Mach 3.5, and there we just crossed Mach 3, I heard that call out. Once you get up to about Mach 3.5, you can then turn on the scram engines to do, a, to do a scram ascent. And the scram ascent is where people typically run into problems with overheating the vessel and burning up. And I'll try to demonstrate a little bit about why that is. Okay, we're at Mach 4, so now I'm gonna open the scram doors here. And again, in your particular uh, 
if your resolution's different, your scram doors might be up at the top instead of down here at the bottom. Watch, notice the heat. I'm getting hot already. Turn on the scram engines. And this is what I'm talking about. See how I'm already up to 14... Uh, actually, I might even blow it up. No, I was really close there. I had to pitch way up really quickly to prevent myself from overheating. And if we look at it, the external view, you can see what's happening. You know, we're, we're nearly incinerating the vessel. So you, the way that you prevent that, you have to stay ahead of the temperature warning. Basically, everything that's happening with the temperature warning is a result of what you did 10, 20, 30 seconds ago. So if you get to that point where you're overheating and then you try to pull way back, there's a good chance it's too late and you will uh, overheat the vessel anyway. I'm actually going to roll over at the moment because my vertical speed's too high and I want to bring it down. So you want to, when you're, when you're taking off and bringing the XR2 up to orbit, you want to stay low enough in the atmosphere that the scram engines are giving you a lot of benefit but you want to be high up enough in the atmosphere that you're not overheating. Currently, because this is an example and I'm not flying very well, I'm actually way too high up in the atmosphere considering my velocity. So there's absolutely nothing to worry about in terms of overheating. But if you find that you're constantly overheating, then you'll want to just repeat the flight and get up another three, four kilometers higher than you were on the previous flight. And now I'm basically, Not vertical 30. speed's almost zero. So I'm gonna roll back over. But I've gotten several comments from people over the years that uh, when they install the XR2, they can't get to orbit because they're just constantly burning up and they don't know what to do about it. But you can see here in, in this bad example, but nevertheless an, an example, all the same, that the way you stay ahead of the heat curve, if you want to call it the heat curve, is just simply by increasing your altitude. That's that's all there is to it. But you don't want to increase your altitude too much because then you're not getting very good utilization out of the scram engines. So there's a balance there. It's it's called what's it what it's called. It's called the ascent profile. And the more efficient your ascent profile is, the less delta V, the less the, I should say fuel the less main fuel you'll burn on the ride to orbit. And really you want to arrive in orbit with all your main, with as much main fuel left as you can. Of course you won't have all of it because you do have to use some of your main fuel to get up off the ground. And over here, the scram diffuser temperature, once it reaches a little higher than it is now, we absolutely have to close the scram doors or else we will burn up the scram engines. And that will be, that's another form of failure. We're getting really close to that point. You can see it's in the yellow. So I'm going to go ahead and close the scram engines now. And now we can pitch up. Actually, I shouldn't let myself descend as much as I did. Uh, once, once we're done with the scram engines, there's no need to stay low in the atmosphere anymore because we're just getting drag for no reason. So once you close the scram engines, uh, you can then pitch up a bit more aggressively. And actually, I forgot to go back. I forgot to turn the main engines back on because I'm not paying attention to things. But you can see that that's, uh, that gets us up to orbital velocity and you know projection distance. And we're almost, uh, we're almost at orbital speed here in just another thousand meters a second. Okay, well that's, that's good enough for that. And go ahead and turn the APU off just to get rid of the noise. And that's just a general, just a very brief overview of the XR2. It really just it requires a lot of hands-on experience. You just have to spend the time with it, take off, fly around KSC, land a few times, go from KSC to Habana. Habana's pretty close, so it doesn't take long to fly over there. Uh, practice getting up into orbit. Many times, you know, if you go all the way back to when you were brand new to orbiter and you, you remember how many times you had to maybe take off and get into orbit just using the standard delta glider. When you pick up a brand new vessel, uh, you pretty much have to start that whole learning experience um, over 
all over again to some extent. Of course, you can use the knowledge that you gained. You know, for example, you know what orbital velocity is and you know what a circular orbit looks like. But getting up to that point is going to change from one vessel to the to the next. You know, if you, especially if you've gone from the standard Delta glider to the space shuttle or the standard Delta glider to the shuttle A, you know that getting those vessels into orbit is quite a bit different than getting the standard Delta glider into orbit. Likewise, the XR2 is going to be different as well. And so you just have to expect that you're going to have quite a few Mark failures before you figure it all out and have success. So that's going to be it for this video. If you like the video, like the video. If you dislike the video, dislike the video. Check out the description down below for a link to my Facebook page where you can uh, subscribe to that. Check out all my Orbiter videos and other space-related content that I post on there. If you like the content that you see here on my YouTube channel, subscribe if you're not already subscribed. See you in the next video.